This is the European edition of Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. We bring you the European unicorn startups, founders, regulators and leaders innovating the rapidly evolving fintech scene today. A truly localized podcast with both English and local language content with some of the world's most well-known hosts and influencers in the fintech sector globally. Join us every week as we explore what makes the European Union a phenomenal proving ground for many of the fastest growing fintech plays in the world today. Okay, let's roll. Buongiorno a tutti, I am Paolo Sironi, your monthly host for the Bankers Bookshelf. Every month we get inspired all together by the authors and the researchers of the most interesting books and the papers which are finding a prominent space in the libraries of curious bankers and fintech entrepreneurs. And today I have the pleasure to host Chris Kinner, a long-standing friend and a key voice in the fintech ecosystem. Chris has authored multiple and successful titles about how technology is changing the financial services landscape. And I'm thrilled he joined us at the Bankers Bookshelf today for an open conversation about his latest book, Intelligent Money, When Money Thinks of You. Chris, welcome to the Bankers Bookshelf. Ciao bene, come sta Paolo? Molto bene, grazie. Now, Chris, you are one of the guys who needs no introduction in FinTech, really. But as we continuously expand our audience at the Bankers Bookshelf, will you share some key highlights about your experience and engagement at the intersection between technology and financial services? Well, I do often find um, that I turn up at conferences and people say, what do you do? So obviously not everybody knows what I do. Um, Basically, I've been in financial technology since before most people were born. Um, and I've worked in delivering technology into financial services all of my life. Uh, I, I was made redundant in 2002, and ever since then, I've been writing and speaking about finance technology in the future, which is my passion. Um, the result is 18 books and a blog that's consistently been written every single day since 2007 at thefinancer.com which um, a lot of people are fans. And if you don't know it, subscribe. Yes, absolutely relentless. I'm one of the subscribers and I invite everyone to follow your work on a daily basis. Now, getting back to your latest book, Intelligent Money, according to your thinking, as money becomes digital, there is a precondition. Um, It will revolutionize uh, major aspects of life and financial services, uh, say by 2030, which is not far ahead in the future. Um, I identified a few attributes that you say will characterize digital money. And they are the fact that uh, money will be personalized. So the personalization of money. Second, the individualization on currency and its usage, discussions possibly around CBDCs the automation of investing and risk management, and the resulting simplification of life experiences. So personalization, individualization, automation, and simplification. Now, this book actually is about uh, centralization versus decentralization, is about fiat versus digital, is about local currencies versus global CBDCs, uh, and actually much more. And uh, as always with your work, uh, enjoyable to read uh, and learn from. Now, among the key messages, I guess the most critical aspects of this book are the interpretation about how money can become intelligent, which requires it, which requires it to act digitally and somehow artificially. So now a lot of concepts that I put together in my intro, so we can start. First of all, two key areas where we did a book, AI and democratization. Can you describe them? Yeah, I mean, your introduction there has shown there's an awful lot of areas that we're trying to delve into. Um, 
originally when I started writing Intelligent Money, it was the friction between the libertarians and the, st the statists or statists, depending on your in, um, pronunciation, um, you know, centralization versus decentralization, the democratization of money and what does that mean versus fiat currencies, as you've mentioned. And then I realized, um, particularly when ChatGPT from OpenAI launched and caused such a major headline that um, AI, um, artificial intelligence, was now a massive focus. Um, and it's interesting because it's something that's not new. It's you know been bubbling away for, um, some would say, over 70 years since the Turing test back in the Second World War. Um, but... I was dealing with AI in the 1990s and in investment markets, looking at neural networks and paired trading. But now it's really become full force. So I guess the main theme of the book is those two areas, artificial intelligence and the decentralization of money. And what happens if you can democratize money and make it intelligent, which some people are doing. Um, and it's a huge challenge, therefore, for governments about how to retain law and order and control. So essentially, artificial intelligence is not new technology. As you said, the first investments uh, started uh, 70 years ago or uh, intensity research started in the 1950s. Uh, what is different today is that it is maturing uh, and it can mature also because uh, cloud infrastructure is more pervasive than in the past. Mobile technology is everywhere. So you can now run some uh, Apple intelligence, to give an example, on your uh, local device. And at the same time, there has been a strong trend in terms of uh, decentralization of financial services. Uh, so leveraging blockchain or not to create a different way of engaging uh, among uh, agents uh, within jurisdictions and across uh, jurisdictions. So, so what you say is that these are the two key pillars that you discuss uh, in your book in terms of how they're evolving and how they are impacting uh, finally the life of individuals, correct? Yeah, in this book, most definitely that is the focus, which is AI and crypto, um, I guess. Um, but what I think is interesting is, and I have a slide in my presentation um, around eventually things emerge at the right time. And what I mean by that is there's an awful lot of technologies that you and I could predict will be massively transformational. Um, but it, it takes the right company at the right time to make that transformation. Um, Apple, when they launched the iPhone back in the 2000s, I think was one of those moments, taking the iPod into a mobile network. Right now, artificial intelligence with ChatGPT has made that transformation from you know, what was something that was exotic and esoteric into mainstream society. Um, biometrics, you know, we predicted for a long time that biometric authentication would become mainstream but it took the smartphone to make that happen. And the next generation of technologies, and this is probably going to be the theme of my next books, <laughs> um, mm. is quantum computing, um, which at the moment is, again, a, a topic that's out there, but no one really knows what it's going to mean to the average person on the street. Um, it will be mainstream within 10 years. And what it really means is that um, technology becomes all-encompassing it's ubiquitous it's omnipresent it's there all the time it's already there all the time but suddenly you could actually connect with anybody anywhere everywhere all the time and feel like they're in the room with you as a hologram you know that's the sort of things we're moving towards well, the interesting part of quantum is also that is a hardware development at uh, the extreme and the resurgence of AI is also the resurgence of the microchip. Think about uh, the uh, NVIDIA uh, extraordinary and stellar performance and uh, creation of new chips. Now, you mentioned ChatGPT. Clearly, everyone now is capable of accessing uh, a piece of AI through generative AI um, at fairly cheap prices, but applying uh, or accessing AI for your personal usage uh, is different than applying it to financial institutions. Now, 
in your experience, as you talk to so many banks uh, and uh, fintech entrepreneurs around the world, what has been the impact of AI so far in financial services? Well, most of AI in the last 15, 20 years has been used for investment markets, as I mentioned, pair trading, neural networking. Um, moving into flash trading and algorithmic trading, um, but equally being applied to uh, risk and fraud management um, and not so much into customer experience and customer service. Uh, you know, when you look at what most banks have launched, it's um, very simplistic chatbots. Um, so... You, know, you can talk to what appears to be a human online, but it's not a human, it's a machine. Um, and they're pretty dumb, if I'm honest. And this is one of the things I keep coming back to, which is you can't be artificially intelligent if you're dumb with data. And um, you've got to be smart. You've got to reorganize around custom holistic solutions. And you've got to have a 360-degree view of the customer to do that. And this has been something that's been a mantra from the technology industry for um, decades. And yet most banks, particularly traditional banks, haven't got anywhere near there, which is why the reasons of the challenger banks and neobanks has been so successful. And although challenger and neobanks were being dismissed 10 years ago, um, today, you've got to take them seriously. You know, Revolut's got 43 million customers and growing. Monzo's almost at 10 million. New Bank's over 100 million. And you, you, you can't ignore these guys anymore. And the reason why they're successful is they're using intelligence with data, which is not what traditional banks do. So if you're done with data, you've got to get smart. Yes, absolutely. I was actually sitting with the friends at New Bank just a few days ago discussing uh, their strategy and how they intend to tackle uh, new markets, uh, starting from uh, from the Brazilian operations. Now, data architectures precede uh, AI architectures. Uh, I also agree. In a recent research published by the IBM Institute for Business Value, we surveyed uh, 600 uh, bankers worldwide with responsibility on data and AI, and we asked them where they see more value in terms of application of generative AI to business domains. 32% say the largest court said uh, uh, risk and compliance, which security, then client engagement, and then we have uh, IT development and other functional areas. Some examples that you can give us on where you see some uh, um, good applications of AI in financial services. I guess my favorite one um, is actually now quite a long time ago, 2017, when it was announced that um, JP Morgan Chase can process contracts with commercial clients in one second that historically would have taken 360,000 hours of lawyer's time. And so basically the AI is just um, connecting and analyzing the wording in contracts which previously lawyers would do. And the reason why I like that- AI is as evil as a lawyer. Well, the reason <laughs> the reason why I like that headline is you can get rid of fifteen hundred lawyers, and you know, getting rid of lawyers seems like a good idea. Um, but it really comes down to um, you know automating the mundane and augmenting the human. And I find it really interesting that a lot of people are so worried about what AI means for the future of humanity that um, we're running scared of it, and so. You know, it's a lot to do with the entertainment and media. Um, you know, the future is Cyberdyne Systems and Terminator, or is it um, Joaquin Phoenix and Scarlett Johansson in Her, which is a great movie if you haven't seen it. Um, you know, we fall in love with the operating system or the operating, or the operating system kills us. Um, what's going to happen in practical use in financial services, as I mentioned, is a lot more analytics around behavioral analysis and so um i i remember when i visited with alipay in china that they look very carefully at um the risk of a payment not being normal using ai in their systems architecture and one of the things i love about alipay and the reason why i keep talking about them 
is um, they regenerate their systems every three or four years. Mm -hmm. And so when I was there, they were just on their fourth generation of systems. And it was all about using artificial intelligence for analytics around fraud. Whereas now they're in their fifth, starting on their sixth generation of systems, which are scaling to 2 billion users processing over a million transactions per second and everything bulletproof, robust and resilient thanks to AI. So for me, that's one of the best examples of a poster child of where we're going. This conversation ties well with the next episode of the Bank and Bookshelf. Anticipate to the audience, we discuss uh, artificial general intelligence, or maybe not, uh, discussing a book, uh, Machines Will Not Rule the World. So stay tuned with us. We continue with Chris, but uh, linking well to the next episode. Now, reading your book, Chris, uh, I enjoyed every page. Uh, but the very beginning is also, I would say, super entertaining because you talk about uh, speaking at a conference some years ago in New York, if I remember well, in front of a, a bunch of libertarians, that's how you call them, or Bitcoiners in essence, and expressing your views about centralization, decentralization, the need of government for exchanging money. Your mind changed since then. Clearly, you survived that conference. I, I did. Um, but the libertarian audience hated me because they thought I was a statist by saying that you cannot have money without government. Um, and as my thoughts have evolved over the 15 years, I realized that they didn't understand what I meant, which is you cannot have money without government. But the question is, who is the government? And they assumed I meant the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England or the European Central Bank or the People's Bank of China, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I, that's not what I meant. I, I meant that you've got to have trust to exchange value. And money is the value that we exchange. And the government of that value that we exchange is the one we trust. So the question really is, who do you trust? And the libertarians trust the network. They trust the internet. They trust the majority of the people. And that's fine as long as it works. And if it breaks, you've got to have a different form of trust, maybe in a central bank, maybe in a government. Um, but I th I think what's interesting, and, and this is actually one, one of the big themes of the book, is um, the breakdown of law and order and control. You know, I, I think central banks, governments, and national states have a big issue because we've moved into a global network of the people, which is very different. And how you apply control to a global network that's outside the central government is a huge challenge. Now, there are developments that's trying to uh, you know, address that issue. But the only way in which you can control the people is if they are within your national borders and national controls. And that's what I think is broken. And that's what cryptocurrencies represent. So I've been involved in this area for a long time, um, you know, ever since Bitcoin launched in 2009. And from my perspective, I think we've reached this point where if you can only control nations and peoples if they cash out and if they're visible you have a huge issue when we have a dark web and a whole globe that's connected that's invisible and that's where i feel this big friction between decentralization and centralization most likely, like in my in my research, I also identify uh, the nature of money of being about emotion. That means it's linked to the survival of individuals and overall societies. The survival can be uh, tackled in different ways. The national governments are changing. The scope borders are less defined as in the past. So, so they may dictate for uh, different solutions to make sure that uh, the trade-off between privacy and the need for survival is found in uh, hopefully the most uh, enriching way for for the individuals 
that in this landscape that you describe, uh, in which uh, borders are blurred, uh, we see the emergence of uh, central bank digital currencies, which sound centralized in origin because the central bank might, might be, if you like, uh, more open for interconnections uh, uh, on the global stage compared to the previous way of sharing the money in a dollar denominated world. So do you believe that CBDCs are effectively happening? beyond the research and the headlines and in the DSY. Yeah, I mean, CBDC, central bank digital currencies, is the hot topic in almost every country and economy. Um, it's particularly being developed across um, China and Europe. Um, the Bank of England's made various uh, commitments to doing something, but they haven't actually said what they'll do yet. Um, the digital dollar is under discussion. Um, and a lot of people wonder what we actually would need those for, in that at the moment we have the reserve currency of the world, the US dollar, which can be exchanged digitally, but also physically. So why would you need a CBDC digital dollar instead of the existing dollar? Um, I guess that's a question. It was interesting the other day because I was talking to a um, foreign exchange fintech startup called LoopFX, who were telling me about seven and a half trillion US dollars are traded every day in the foreign exchange markets. And they're tackling the way in which that's done using a dark pool, which is um, an investment market's uh, capability to do trading uh, kind of invisibly uh, underneath the hood. Um, and as I think about those things, what does a digital currency give us that we don't already have? And that I can trade dollars and pounds and sterling and euros already digitally. So why do I need a CBDC? And equally, the other argument against CBDCs is that for a lot of people, they feel uncomfortable with the idea of trading fiat currencies digitally because they're going to be tracked and traced it's not anonymous in the same way as giving a cash note over the counter and so there's a, a lot of layers of issue around why do we need a cbdc because my best example maybe is in sweden where people could put chips inside their bodies to travel and connect and pay across the whole of sweden using an NFC chip. Um, but most people didn't want it because they thought the government would watch where they're going and what they're doing. And that to me is the issue of a CBDC. Is it entirely untraceable? And if it isn't, it will never substitute cash. I was actually uh, speaking at the BIS Innovation Summit a couple of years ago and then listening to central bankers talking about CBDC. There was a clear divide between uh, Christine Lagarde or uh, someone in the Western world compared to the central bankers in Asia Pacific exactly on the topic of uh, privacy and how to operate that. Uh, if I can add, my, my major element of attention is uh, the engineering or the over-engineering. When a solution is over-engineered, that uh, is always a concern. When a solution is simple, that is the one that can spread out. So I think that we still have to find a balance on CBDCs between engineering and over-engineering of the solution to 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 make the best read off about these elements. But you are uh, ingrained into uh, so many conversations um, with the fintech entrepreneurs and banks uh, around uh, uh, what is really um, coming next, uh, what is used to today, and what didn't work in the past. Now, if you had to say what's hot now and what's not, what would you say? Well, I was intrigued the other day. I was talking to uh, a, 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 a venture capital fund, um, and they asked me to talk about what's hot and what's not. Um, and their conclusion was uh, what's not hot is digital banking, challenger banks, neo banks. They think that's done. I kind of disagree because I still think there's a way to go. Um, but it depends which country you're coming from as to how far it's gone. You know, the UK has developed digital banks quite extensively in the past decade. Starling, um, you know, 
Monzo and Revolut. Um, Europe's developed quite extensively with N26, Bunk and Revolut. Um, the US is still early days in my view. Um, Chime is doing pretty well. Um, South America's new bank is doing really well. So I would say digital banking is not done, um, particularly when you talk about the AI generative finance perspective of digital banking, which um, I think is still a huge open space because it's not being served today. Um, what's hot is obviously artificial intelligence going to generative finance. Um, and it's intriguing, though, that in talking to other investors, um, the B2B space is really interesting. And in I think a lot of commercial investment banking, private banking, has not been attacked by fintech enough yet. Wealth management is still, you know, very basic. In that, robo advisory is a long way away from uh, personal advisory. Um, and those areas, I think, will get really interesting in the next decade. Um, so the B two B to C financial generative finance space is, I think, what's really hot. I typically don't ask my barber if I need a haircut. I'm not asking VC where I should invest my money. There's a conflict of interest there. <laughs> but if they're powerful, maybe they make sense. Now, given this landscape, uh, you mentioned quantum computing. Is that where you're going to focus in the next few years in terms of literature and research, or there are other areas? Uh, I mean, I think quantum is a big space that's emerging. It's not actually delivered yet. And I do remember going back to your organization, Paolo, being in Davos and IBM had a quantum computer that was on display. Um, it didn't really do very much, but it looked amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and quantum kind of, I think, is seriously confusing for most people because it's based on this idea of Schrodinger's cat for mm -hmm. the qubits. And so basically, um, today's computing is all ones and zeros but tomorrow's computing is you don't know whether it's a one or a zero until you land in that space um the idea of qubits and quantum computing is that the power of today's technologies is going to be amplified a thousand times more or even bigger than that we don't know yet um but i do think it's interesting that if we look at quantum in finance and the idea that we could do a thousand times more processing than we can do today then particularly in the investment markets that's going to have a massive impact it's not so much for the person on the street because you know we just want stability security reliability but for global connectivity of investment markets it's going to be lightning speed and flash trading today will just look like a poor limp you know brother of flash trading tomorrow well like a quantum computing uh, i guess it's like uh travel uh, to go from frankfurt uh, to new york you take a taxi to the airport and then catch a flight so is a personal computer normal computing uh, when you go to the airport and then quantum computing for doing a uh, part of the, the 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 journey that might take otherwise too long an interesting field of research now is the intersection between ai and quantum which is primarily how quantum can add uh, value to the AI process when the uh, computational element becomes too intense uh, to resolve some of the intricacies of looking at the uh, large complexes uh, complexities in terms of data sets uh, and and i'm sure that the researchers will come out with uh, more uh, entertaining and engaging uh, solutions uh, anytime soon as the technology is effectively evolving now one thing that you are also famous for uh, at least uh, um, for people that know you well uh, is the captain cake so Chris Keener is not just a guy for uh, serious topics uh, like uh, fintech uh, technology banking but also children's books uh, which by the way are serious enough for children are uh, children education is a serious topic can you explain a little bit about your piece of literature here and what is this all about it's a fairly silly thing but um during the pandemic i sat down with my two boys who are twins and at that time four years old and i got fed up reading them julia donaldson and david williams and you know winnie the pooh and general stories so I said, I'm going to tell you a story about um, Captain Kirk. 
and they misheard me and said, oh, Captain Cake. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. So um, I started telling them a story about Captain Cake and the Candy Crew, which includes um, Lieutenant Chocolate, Sergeant Jelly, and Private Potato. Um, and Private Potato, uh, to be clear, is the only one of the crew that actually can engineer the ship. Um, but has no special powers. The other has powers of throwing jelly cake and chocolate. Um, and my publisher said, I love this idea of diversity and teamwork and friendship and loyalty. And it became five books, which um, are out there now. You can get them on Amazon and completely changed um, some of the ways in which I think and work. I'm sure that these stories about diversity, teamwork, and success are not just good for kids, but for banks as well. So I invite everyone <laughs> well, <laughs> to if, read if, them. If you actually go to my website, you'll find I've got FinTech for Kids as one of my free books. Um, you can download the PDF, and um, it explains FinTech at the level of the average um, CEO of a bank. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me if I'm right, uh, your website is chriskinners.global. Yep. That's where people can find your work. Christina.global and thefinancer.com. Good. And all your, all your literature and especially intelligent money is on Amazon as well. Yep. Okay. So, Chris, thanks very much for uh, this uh, interesting conversation and highlighting key parts of your thinking and your literature. And I invite everyone to stay tuned for more because uh, more episodes uh, are coming on the Bankers Bookshelf about the interesting books and researchers. Now, it is clear by now that the Bankers Bookshelf is an incredible opportunity to evolve our critical thinking altogether. We get inspired by authors like Chris Skinner of the most interesting books, papers, and publications, which are finding their prominent space in the libraries of curious bankers and fintech entrepreneurs. That's how we can make better informed business decisions. Arrivederci and enjoy the Bankers Bookshelf jingle. Listening to Breaking Banks Europe, a Provoke Media podcast in cooperation with Fintech Stage. Don't forget to tweet us out, shout out, or post to the team at Breaking Banks EU on Twitter. If there's something or someone you'd like to hear on our cast, let us know. See you next week on Breaking Banks Europe.